Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Focus. I'm Deirdre Blake. This week we're discussing a little-known autoimmune disease that threatens to become more common than lupus and multiple sclerosis. It's called antiphospholipid antibody syndrome and even has its own foundation to spread awareness. The APS Foundation of America was started in 2005. It's dedicated to facilitating education, support, and research. APS can affect anyone, anytime. It's described as a snake in the grass that can bite and even kill without warning. In addition to heart attack and stroke, it can also cause problems with thinking and memory, also leading to other neurological symptoms like dizziness and even seizures. APS is so newly discovered, the Rare Thrombotic Disease Consortium is holding a clinical study. They're looking for people to participate, though little is known. They realize that sometimes several members of the same family have APS. Other times one has the condition and others have a similar disease, like lupus or diabetes. Because it can run in families, their study aims to pinpoint the genetic pattern that causes the antibody in the blood. More and more support is available, as we'll hear later from one of our guests, from online data and Yahoo email groups, even to a MySpace forum. We're joined by Tina Pullman. She's an APS patient of seven years and co-founder of the APS Foundation of America. Joining her in our discussion is Dr. Sudeep Menacheri. He's a hematologist from the Fredericksburg area, and he actually treats patients with the condition. Tina, tell us, first of all, what is APS? Well, um, APS is uh, the long word for it is antiphospholipid antibody syndrome and is also known as APLS and APA, APLA in, uh, or Hugh syndrome in the United Kingdom. It's a autoimmune blood clotting disorder. How do you know if you might have this condition? I mean, what are some of the symptoms? This, I, I have a feeling this may be something unless people know they're suffering from it, they may not be aware of. Right. There's a lot of people that may not know that they have that, and granted, all the symptoms that I'm going to list may not mean that they actually have it. Um, physicians use a combination of clinical symptoms and laboratory tests to diagnose for APS. Um, p- patients with, with these antibodies may experience blood clots, including heart attacks and strokes, and usually those are found in young, younger, younger people, and some may have um, miscarriages. But really, the symptoms of APS is tricky. Not everyone has all the symptoms. Some may have some of them, not all of them, and then there's some that have all of them. So, and not all these symptoms mean that you necessarily have APS. You can have something else and, and totally in between. Dr. Minicherry, tell me, first of all, for people that haven't tried to get pregnant to have had a miscarriage or have never known that they had a blood clot, are there any other signs that would make people go, wait a minute, maybe I should get checked for this? Yeah, there, there's one of the laboratory tests that can happen. is, is One can have a uh, low platelet count. Um, <clears throat> and once again, your, your doctor, it, it's a pretty uh, standard test of CBC that uh, will show whether your platelet count is normal or not, and, and that can also sometimes tip people off to whether they have it. What causes the antibody? The antibody is actually caused by something that your body makes against proteins that are actually already in your body, and they're usually two things on your cell surface and various proteins that your body makes. Are people born with this? Uh, no, they're not. Uh, they can actually acquire this uh, later on in life. Are men or women more likely to have the condition, Tina? Well, women are more likely to have APS, but men can also have APS. When I, I first discussed APS with my doctor, I was told this was only a pregnant, pregnant woman's problem. The funny thing was, I wasn't pregnant at the time. Um, and he, he basically told me I didn't need to worry about it until I got pregnant. He was, obviously, he was really wrong but women are most likely to get APS. Is there a cure for APS? Sadly, there isn't a cure for APS at, the time, at this time, but we are working on, on, on a cure. We're trying to find something, but there are treatments for some of its symptoms. Um, APS patients are encouraged to exercise, lose weight, eat, eat a low-fat, low low-cholesterol low diet, and work on lowering their cholesterol overall and stop smoking if they do they do smoke, um, so it's about reducing those risk factors as much as they possibly can since we can't control the APS necessarily. Who should take medication for this? Well, a couple of the symptoms or uh, manifestations of this uh, disease is, uh, first and foremost, people can develop clots, blood clots, usually either in your legs or in your lungs. Some people also have miscarriages, um, and those are probably the two biggest indications for treatment. 
and the treatment usually for those indications are blood thinners. How often are blood thinners prescribed for this condition? Okay, blood thinners are prescribed for people that have um, they, that they have a clotting event, such as like a T, TIA um, stroke or a a deep vein thrombosis. So um, they're not prescribed for somebody, let's say, that just has has the antibodies and hasn't had some sort of clotting event to go with it. So um, are the majority of the pa- patients that are on a- that have APS on blood thinners? Yes. Um, is there a hard cut core, like this is what happens, you know, this, this, and this has to happen be- before they get put on blood thinners? No, it's, the treatment with APS is really, really individualized. Are there side effects from the treatment for this? You know, when we talk about the treatment for this, uh, you know, what we were, a lot of what we talk about is this treatment for the, for the sequelae of the disease, which are the blood clots. So when we use blood thinners, the biggest side effect that one can have is bleeding. How important is it then, obviously, for, for folks to let their doctor know that they are taking blood thinners for this condition? Uh, it, it's very important because I think it, it takes uh, really appropriate management on the side of physicians as far as uh, exactly when to stop the blood thinner before surgery and exactly when to start it again immediately following surgery. Dr. Menacheri, on a typical day-to-day basis, how important is managing and taking the medication for APS and using it properly? Uh, it's very important. We've seen um, patients miss, you know, just uh, a dose or uh, even patients that take their medications appropriately and still develop blood clots. So um, I'd like to think that missing one dose is, for the most part, is not going to cause any uh, problems, but it's true that even if you're very compliant with the medications or the blood thinners, that one can still develop a blood clot, or even a miscarriage for that matter. We just talked about miscarriages, and as you said, APS can be linked to them in some women. How can this be dealt with? Um, you know, right now, I, I don't know that there are a lot of good strategies uh, as yet. Um, there are some new things on the horizon, but a lot of the standard right now is just, uh, trying to use blood thinners throughout pregnancy. Um, and blood thinners come in various forms. Uh, first and foremost, people can use things like aspirin, uh, which is probably the lowest dose of some kind of blood thinner that one can use. And the next step up, step up would be something like heparin or Lovenox uh, and trying to use it very aggressively during the term of pregnancy to to try and prevent miscarriages from occurring. Can those be dangerous to the baby? Um, For the most part, no. I mean, we've used them before in pregnancy very safely, um, and and there's not been any increased risk of uh, bleeding or uh, the complications that one would expect. What are some of the other conditions that APS has been known to be linked to? Um, typically, the biggest ones um, that co- come to my mind is um, lupus and MS. Since APS is an autoimmune clotting disorder, autoimmune uh, diseases tend to run in in um, groups. There's a lot of overlap in symptoms and overlap in diagnosis, and it seems to be where there's one autoimmune problem in, in a person, there's more. Once I got diagnosed with APS, we found out that I had several other autoimmune disorders going on. I'm like, oh, okay. So it all kind of ties in together. Of course, we also have that um, bonus factor that we have the clotting side of this. So we have heart attacks. So we have to worry about heart attacks, strokes, and DVT, and all these other little uh, things that we shouldn't have to worry about until we're older. Tina, what are some of the things that need to be considered to reduce the risk of bleeding? We, from our research, we hear that there are certain activities that really should be avoided just for safety measures. Right. Since the majority of us that have APS are on, on some sort of blood thinner like warfarin, first and foremost, we need to be careful with contact sports. Um, they're not, not typically recommended. Of course, we always have some that still go, and we hope that they don't get hurt. But if they do go, they, you know, hopefully they have their medical alert bracelet on that they, you know, paramedics know that they, they're, they're on blood thinners. Um, the other thing that you may notice is that a little, um, you might bruise a little bit easier and cuts will, cuts will bleed longer than, than they used to because obviously you're taking um, a blood thinner. Injuries can be more serious when you're taking blood thinners and it's, you should take, be taken care of during any activity that could result in injury. So if you're out biking, obviously wear your helmet. Good idea anytime, but 
you know, definitely make sure you have your, your helmet on when you're out biking or rollerblading. Um, just because your brain is so sensitive to bleeding while you're on, while you're on blood thinners. Um, and if you, there is serious injury, obviously please go to your local emergency r- room or call 911. We also suggest, just because you're, um, you're on blood thinners, that people should wear a medical alert bracelet at all times, just because it's, the bracelet is most visible and you may not be able to talk. Something may have happened that you're unconscious and you want, you want that bracelet to be able to talk for you. Some of your literature on the APS website suggests that people keep a medical journal for themselves. What does that include, and why is it important for the patient to do that? Medical journals, oh gosh. Um, this, this is the, the thing that's kind of helped me get my do- diagnos- diagnosis. We suggest keeping a medical journal to keep track of any events. Such, um, we tell people to list the date, the time, the symptom, how long it lasted, and the severity, and if they think think that they might, what have, might have triggered it. Was it, you know, did, was there a weather change? Because there's a lot of us that have, like, headaches and little things that we don't want to call our doctors necessarily for, and some of us should be calling our doctors for, but we just kind of keep it a journal of things. Um, I, I myself journaled my rashes. I have a mess of rashes and all these color changes that I was getting in my skin, and I get to the doctor, and it wouldn't be there. It's just, like taking a little kid to the hospital when they're running a fever and the fever, you know, magically disappears. Um, so I, for me, I started a photo journal. This, is, this always is helpful, like I said, to show doctors since the rash, your color changes, or your symptoms may be gone by the time you get to the appointment, get to your appointment. If you, you can also help you re, to remember any questions that you may have to, um, and take that journal with, with your appoint, to your appointment so you can write down okay, this is what the doctor said, these are the new medications that I'm going to be placed on. So you have everything all in one, one central location. And I found through my journal that what my anticoagulation pattern was and the times in, in the, during the year that I, it's predicted that I may have a flare. So I found in the spring and the fall is when I seem to have most of my APS symptoms. Like it seems just to get really, really revved up. Um, and it also helps me remember what was said, like I said, during the various appointments with all the different specialists that I have to see for my treatment. So that's, it's just a useful tool. Traveling is noted as one of the things that is an issue for people with this condition, whether it be driving, flying, et cetera. Why is that, and what can people do to mitigate the problem? Well, traveling in general, I mean, we can, we can travel. It's just we have to take extra precautions, which is... Good thing, bad thing. Um, we can get on the airplanes and we can go. Um, we just have to drink extra water. Of course, now with the TSA having the water issue and charging for water, it becomes a little bit more difficult. So we, you want to make sure on long trips and especially by air and have someone even with, with a cl- you can have a clotting risk even for those people who don't have APS. It's important for us, for us to get up and walk around at least a couple, every couple hours. Um, so if you're driving, pull over. You know, this is a good time to go get that soda at that local local gas station, fill up your car, stretch, stretch, walk, walk around, read those signs on the side of the road. Um, on long car, car trips, like I said, get out, walk around, try to get those aisle seats when you're on an airplane. Drink plenty of water, and some people do also wear compression stockings, medical-grade compression stockings, which will help the circulation in your legs. Um, if you plan to be away during during it, that that um, Traveling during that time for your, we have a blood test that we take usually about weekly when we're on um, blood thinners, arrange that test ahead of time. We also suggest when you're traveling that um, you know where the hospitals are in the area that you're going to just in case there's, you have an emergency while you're traveling to see if, make sure your insurance is covered and if you need traveling insurance that you have that with you. If you've just tuned in, you're listening to Focus. This week, we're discussing a rare autoimmune condition that causes blood clots and other problems. It's known as APS. We're talking to APS Foundation of America co-founder Tina Pullman and local hematologist Dr. Sudeep Menacheri. Tina, this is a, a fairly new condition that has come to light with myself, and I'm assuming many of our listeners. It seems so overwhelming. Is there any advice that you can give people to cope with this condition if they think they have it or once they're diagnosed? This disease is totally overwhelming, and when you're first diagnosed, 
you may or may not get a lot of information. You go on the Internet, and you probably get it and jump into a support forum. You're going to get bogged down with so information, your eyes are just going to glaze right over. And what we're trying to do today is break it down for everybody, take that little piece at a bit at a time. APS treatment is lifelong. Um, the treatment of blood clots caused by APS outweighs the minimal side effects of the treatment. Most of the time, people with APS will appear on the outside as they did before they were diagnosed. Because of this, it, it may be difficult for family and friends to understand that you have a life-threatening illness and that you just can't do the things that you could before. You don't know how many times personally I get, but you look great today, and I may look like I feel great, but I'm really not feeling great, and it's, it's really, really frustrating. Um, they can't see, the problem is they can't see what's going on with your body, and this can be, becomes quite frustrating on both ends. In some cases, you may want a therapist just to help you adjust. I see a therapist, she's great, she keeps me on my level, level playing field and my, my sounding board on how I want to deal, deal with things and how to deal with in my medical frustrations and my family frustrations and everything that's going on in my life that has everything to do with APS, it seems. Um, any person with a life-threatening disease is at risk for being depressed. And in some cases, this prog progresses to clinical depression. It is very important to discuss your mental health with your doctor as well as your physical health. The APS Foundation has a place on the Internet where you can communicate with others to, that have this disease. Um, you can find that site at www.apsfa.org. You are the only one that knows exactly how you feel. Others with the same disease are often, are often very understanding, and support, support groups of some kind can make your, make your life much fuller. Your immediate family and children should be told about your disease, how it affects you, and what it means, means to them as well, so that you, and what you can expect from them and support. The good news is that many people with proper treatment live normal, full lives. Others may have find that their lives have changed forever due to APS, but the positive attitude will mean that the life can still be worth, worthwhile and fulfilling as the correct treatment provides the further problem. Are you willing to share with us how you found out you had APS and, and really how that's changed your life since? Um, my, my whole thing goes back to probably, we're guessing now, looking back at my history, um, that I probably had this since I got mono. We, we feel that mono was probably the triggering point for myself. I was diagnosed in 2002. It was started out um, as a summer day watching, um, I think it was the Country Music Awards, actually. Um, I was watching television, lost the vision in my eye, which kind of freaked me out. Called an ambulance, got to that hospital. They told me, well, there was I was too young to be possibly having these problems to go home, and I the whole time I was like, there's something more going on, and started getting on the internet and I'm like, you know that birth control that that's it, you know, stop that birth control, and well, they gave me aspirin, you know, this could have been a stroke, and so I started myself on baby aspirin. A couple months later, after I was off the birth control, I ended up getting a deep vein thrombosis, and things just kind of pro progressed from there and started putting two and two together and started keeping a journal myself and went back and looked at my, you know, my, my diaries from growing up and how I was always dizzy and I was always having, couldn't remember and I couldn't keep up with the kids, you know, I was always just tired and, you know, and... Growing up, I was just told that I just didn't want to be in school, which wasn't the case, and so it was just a lot, a lot of going back and putting, putting my history, my family history, and what was currently going on together, and we came up, did the blood work, found out that I have APS. And how has that modified your life and your lifestyle since then? Um, right now, um, I've got, I can't fly anymore because I have such problems with vertigo. So flying and driving is like the issue. So that, well, who can afford to fly now? But, um, so, but I, I love to travel. So that's kind of put a, a damper on things. Um, all these doctor's appointments, and I, I continue to have have problems, even though I am on um, proper 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 medication. And 
um, I can't predict my health anymore, so now I am on disability, which is giving me the freedom to, like, if I need to take take a nap in the middle of the day, I can take a nap, and I'm not going to have uh, somebody yelling at me saying, oh, you took a nap and you had to leave work early, and why were you, you know, your illness is a matter of convenience. I had been told that by an employer previously, and that was just kind of the, the straw that broke the camel's, camel's back for me and um, went ahead and did the disability thing. So now I've taken, my, taken those lemon, that lemon, lemons that I've been handed in life and made, uh, made some lemonade and just decided that APS needs to get on the map here in the United States and started with two other people from Michigan, started the APS Foundation of America. For our listeners that are hearing this, Tina, and think that they may have this condition, what should they do? Um, Highly suggest that they um, go to the website, www.apsfa.org, and print out the information that's on the page and set up an appointment with their, their primary care physician and sit down and say, look, I have these symptoms. Could this possibly be what is going going on with me? Can we test for this? this our information is there to help facilitate. We don't want anybody being diagnosed from anything, but we want this to facilitate a discussion with your doctor. If you've had all these mis- if you've had a mess in miscarriages and they nobody can seem to explain why, or you've had you're young and you have 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 had deep vein thrombosis, or have had a young stroke, or a young person that has had a heart attack. This is something that they should be looking into, and it'll never, it won't hurt to have your primary care physician, you know, run these tests, and then they may refer you to a rheumatologist or a hematologist, depending on what's going on, or even a neurologist. And then finally, Tina, how could people get involved if they want to help? What can people do? We have several, several things that you can do um, to help the APS Foundation of America. You can volunteer your time and talents in such as the areas fundraising, advocacy. Um, we do need some help with finance, finance and grant writing and support support group experiences. Of course, you can always donate money. I know times are tough, so if you can help us find grants, that'd be, that somebody's out there that is great at grant, grant writing, give us a call or email us. Um, you can check us out at our website, um, APSFA.org. Um, just so you know, the APS Foundation of America is a nonprofit organization. Your donations are greatly needed for us to provide the awareness, support, and education of this, this disease. We need enthusiasm and monitor, monetary support to help our individuals, families, and friends and caregivers battle the long-term consequences caused, caused by this. Um, we do send out information for free. Um, we don't ask any, anything of, of anybody when they request, request stuff. And, our newsletter, we get a lot of high compliments and ask, why don't we charge? And I'm like, we want the information out there. We just want the information out there. And then for you, Dr. Manicherry, the final question that I have for our listeners that are hearing this that think they could have APS, what should they do? Um, first and foremost, is see your doctor. Um, and, you know, the APS can be diagnosed with uh, first by using uh, blood tests. And, and two, is it's just also a good history. Uh, if you've had a history of um, having had blood clots, uh, whether they be in your legs or, or the, if they've traveled to your lungs. Number two, if you've had um, <clears throat> miscarriages. And a lot of the miscarriages in APS, they tend to happen a little bit later on, uh, either in the second or even the third trimester. Uh, miscarriages in the first trimester are actually pretty common. But if, if you've had miscarriages in the second or third trimester, I mean, I think that's another thing that should, that should probably be, be worked up. I, I think we're, this is still a... a disorder uh, that we're learning a lot about, and I think it's, uh, it's really important to try and get uh, tested for it and, and seeing the right uh, doctor for it. Dr. Menacheri, thank you so much for taking the time to share your medical advice with us this week, and to you, Tina, for telling your story of surviving with APS. I'm sure the listeners that need information will find APSFA.org, a valuable resource to them. As always, we do thank all of you for tuning in. I'm Deirdre Blake, and this has been Focus.